Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Day, and we have a great episode for you this week. I had the opportunity to chat with William Vanderblumen, president and CEO of the Vanderblumen Search Group. Uh, William really brings together two important spheres of knowledge to serve the church. His 15 plus years of ministry leadership as a senior pastor and his deep understanding and experience in human services and professional executive search. So together, William's experiences combine to really provide a unique gift for churches and ministries as they seek to connect with the right key people to serve and to lead. William is also the author of Next Pastoral Succession That Works and another book entitled Search, the Pastoral Search Committee Handbook. If you've ever had the opportunity to meet William, you know that he is all about connecting with people and encouraging them to seek God's best. On this week's episode, William provides some practical and encouraging insights, including how to find and keep great church staff, why culture is so vital when it comes to church staff, how to navigate your own pastoral transition, and also he talks about the unique wake-up call he received from God about loyalty and the church. Some great stuff. So join William and me as we talk about some practical nuts and bolts of ministry leadership. William, I just want to welcome you to the Church Leaders Podcast. Uh, it's a privilege to have you with us. Jason, it's, an, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here and uh, love what you guys do. Check out your website all the time and, and just hope we can do something that adds value today. Awesome. I'm sure we can. I know that uh, our pastors and church leaders who are listening in, uh, they're always looking for kind of some of those nuts and bolts, you know, some of those, those strategies and insights that they can put into practice uh, right away, and and that's why I'm excited to have you with us because that's kind of your world. That's what you do. I mean, your your years of of ministry as a lead pastor, and then your years on top of that is serving the church and and helping with the search process, helping pastors find, uh, you know, churches find pastors and and pastors find staff. And so I, I know you have a lot to offer this conversation from your from your experience, both as a pastor and as one who is working with churches to to help them in the, that nature. So. This, like I said, is your world. You've lived on both sides of this equation. And so I just want to start off by, by asking, I know we have lots of pastors who, you know, they're, they're going through periods in their ministry um, where their churches are seeing some growth or, or they're seeing some opportunities to bring members on staff, right? New, new staff pastors. And so what are the keys to really finding great staff? I think the first place to look, and this is going to sound so strange coming from a guy who runs a search firm, but look inside your house, mm. you know, look inside your current church. A lot of you guys that are listening have probably heard the the three C's of hiring. Bill Hybels taught them to me a hundred years ago. You, you've got to have good character. You've got to have good competency and you've got to have chemistry. And I, I, some people will expand that. I expand it a little bit. So character, yeah, you want to make sure uh, that everybody's got a past just so it's in the past. Um, but competency outside of a few roles that are driven by particular skill sets, like if you're hiring a worship pastor, they need to be able to carry a tune. Like that's kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of important, right? Uh, if you're hiring a preaching pastor, they need to be able to communicate. But beyond a few things like that or really technical things like coding or whatever, most church jobs, the competency can be learned. So I I really don't focus on the competency so much anymore as I do on learning agility, like have they shown the ability to pick up new skills and go? Right. And, and, and then the chemistry is basically, would I want to go hang out with this person? But the fourth piece is culture. And I, I think that culture trumps all of the other ones except maybe character. If somebody fits into the family, like they're, they, they're the same kind of crazy that the rest of us on staff are. That's like the biggest part of the puzzle of staffing is making sure there's a cultural fit. If you're looking at someone that's already a part of your church, then that piece of the puzzle is probably solved. Right. And it frees you up to focus on the other things. Now, having said that, there is a healthy percentage of people that you should have that are not from inside your house. And you'll have to determine that. But, I, you know, some people say, well, I want to only hire from people that are within our church. I grew up 
in Western North Carolina, Jason, like maybe an hour or two from where they filmed an old movie called Deliverance. <laughs> <laughs> Banjos. And, uh, right. And so I, I've seen this firsthand. Constant inbreeding, it ends badly. <laughs> right, so, right. So having just people from within your church doesn't work. But I always say look first at the people inside your church. Uh, the other thing that I would say, and this does set at the risk of sounding a little salesy, is hiring is very, very scary. I mean, if you've hired before, you know, even if it's just the absolute right person, the moment before you make that offer, you're like, oh, boy, is this going to work? Because, you know, the most expensive hire you'll ever make is making the wrong hire. Right. Undoing a hire in a church is incredibly difficult. And I think what drives that fear is fear of the unknown. I don't know what I'm getting. I don't know if this will work. I don't know how this will affect our team culture. And that causes some people, I think the natural human tendency is to choose the known over the unknown, right? Right, right. So if, if you're already afraid of what's going to happen because, you know, if you're adding this person, there will be a tendency to be drawn toward people that you already know, like a buddy from college or Bible college or seminary, or a friend told me that this person was great, or even the person inside your church. You've got to be wary of, of making this decision based on, I know what that is, so I'm going to go with it. And, and the, the way around that, I think, is to have a trusted advisor that helps you identify the positives and negatives. That might be a spiritual mentor. It might be a district superintendent if you're in a denomination that actually works. Um, it might also be uh, some kind of uh, search consultant. I mean, that's kind of what we do sometimes. It's not that we're always finding people that nobody knew about. It's, man, I've known this guy 20 years and I'm, I'm too close to it to know on my own. I'm myopic about it. So help me know what are the strengths and weaknesses and such. So that, that I would start there. Look inside the house and make sure you've got somebody besides you that is helping you guide through the process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and I'm just curious, what what types of things do you and your team, as you're helping a pastor evaluate a candidate, what are some things that you help them look that maybe they wouldn't be looking for themselves? You know, what, what are some of those deeper things that you're able to, to uncover that they might miss? Well, I mean, over the years we've learned – quite a bit about how to interview. I think one of the things that uh, I used to mess up on my journey, maybe the biggest lesson, Jason, I, I told a client this just yesterday, the biggest lesson I had to personally learn, like I was at a church that I, I've learned in Texas, you don't say I was at a really big church because it's different in Texas. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we, I had between the church, I probably had 200 people on staff and then another 150 on the school side. So you know, we had a lot of employees and we did a lot of hiring. And I used to pride myself on my ability to size people up within five minutes. I'll know right away whether they're going to work or not. I just need to sit down with them. And it, it was like a point of pride. I read an article not too long ago about a CEO who was bragging that she does seven minute interviews and then she knows whether to go stay or go with this person. And if there is a single verse that God keeps reminding me of as we interview candidates, it's that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are way more complex than a first impression or how they scored on the disc profile. Or So I'm learning myself, even as a search consultant, that it takes more time than you think to figure out whether this person is going to work or not. My friend Dave Ramsey, who we do quite a bit of work for, now his company's a little bit extreme. They've got a great culture. It's awesome. But if you want a job there, you will, on average, you'll go through 14 to 16 interviews before they make the offer. Wow. I know. I was, I was on the phone with him last week about it, and I said, Dave, I think I could put somebody – place somebody in the CIA quicker than I could place them <laughs> at your company. But he's like, look, man, a bad hire screws up everything. So we're just going to go slow. And too many people go way too fast. So here we could probably churn out. We could probably just send resumes to our clients like, here you go, here you go, here you go, and get more, quote, stuff done quicker. 
but we found that there's always a story underneath the paper. Right. We've also found that pastors are really bad at doing resumes. So we, we don't coach them, but we don't trust what's on paper. We don't trust a personality profile. We don't even trust a, a Skype interview. We, we believe we've got to, uh, to, in order to really get our hands on things, we've got to sit down with that person and face to face and, and really understand things. We tried, uh, gosh, Jason was probably four or five years ago, five years ago, I guess. We thought, wow, smaller churches probably could afford this if we did it all virtually. And we streamlined it, charged a lower fee, and then we could serve more churches and it would be great. And so we, we tried it out for hmm, eight, nine months, something like that. And our client satisfaction uh, rating went down from about 97 or 8 percent to 65 percent. Wow. So we just quit. Right, right. We shuttered it and went back to the old slow way. And that means that I don't get to sleep in my bed every night. But uh, it went right back up. And, I, and we kind of kid around and say the theological takeaway was if virtual really worked, Jesus would have just Skyped it in. <laughs> right, right. So I, I would say, you know, there's a lot to our process and there are a lot of things that we've studied. But some of the things that I didn't know when I was pastoring that I'm learning now that we've done, I think we're right at a thousand searches now, um, is that I need to go slower than my gut wants to. And I can't make blink decisions about people because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Right. And, you know, that taking a little extra time and being face to face makes all the difference in the world. The, the other thing I'll say, sorry to just ramble, but probably over the last three years, certainly two of the last three years, we've spent more time asking ourselves this question and studying to try to figure it out how do you effectively interview the spouse of the person that you want to hire? And man, oh, man. I just don't know any really great pastors that don't have a greater spouse behind them. Right. So th th those are a couple of things that we focus on that my, that I would not have known before I'm doing what I do now. That's good. That's good. Now, I, I think that's great advice, and uh, especially when you're touching on the idea of slowing down, because, you know, there's some situations as pastors, we find ourselves in a place where, you know, we feel like, uh, you know, maybe we've had a, a worship leader, worship pastor, you know, has left. And so now we have this gap and there's that yep. kind of sense of urgency, like, oh, no, what, totally. are, we, you know, what are we going to do? So uh, just the reminder that, hey, God's in control. You know, God wasn't shocked. Right. So yeah. and that we can just slow down and work through the process instead of rushing in, because, you know, really the, the most damaging thing you can probably do is rush in and get the wrong person in there. Then you have to turn around and, uh, you know, go through this whole process again. It's just really more more painful or more challenging for the church as a whole, correct? Well, yeah, and with, I mean, it's always been bad. Firing in the corporate world, you can run calculators on it. We actually have a new cool tool. I, it just came to my mind. Uh, if you listeners want to go to badhirecalculator.church, and, and it asks a series of questions like, how much time are you going to spend? What do you get paid? And it spits out a number that says, based on what you put in here, here's how much it's going to cost you if you hire the wrong person. And that never mind the whole, oh, but his wife was in a small group with a bunch of people that are really upset that they're – Right. It's just unwinding a hire is bad in the corporate world. It's way worse in the church world. So we encourage people to, to go slow. And it's happening right now because the one uh, staff hire that's seasonal that I know uh, – you know, people leave all through the year – but about oh March or April of every year, depending on when Easter is, <laughs> right after Easter, all the student pastors quit and they want to stay through graduation. And then that leaves the senior pastor with, yeah, but I need somebody at summer camp. Right. So we are like we are <laughs> like neck deep in student pastor searches right now. It happens every year. And it's and the pastors are frantic. It's like, ah, what do we do? What do, we do? We've decided that some of the best advice we come across personally for our company that we're advising all of our church leaders to do is develop an emergency succession plan for every single position on your staff. If this person got hit by a bus, who would pick up the slack until we went through a thorough hiring process and, and figured it out? 
And so everyone on our team, down to the intern, admins, to me, has to have a plan that says, if I get taken out or can't come to work or quit or whatever, here's who takes over my work. And I think if churches can do that, it's not who's the permanent hire. Right. It's who can fill in for 90 days on these key areas or how does it get redistributed, redistributed among the staff? Everybody can figure out a 90 day plan. And if you can't figure it out, call us and we'll help you figure one out. But it's not rocket science. And if you've got that in place, it really is a nice way for people to reexamine what they're actually doing with their day. And then it buys you some buffer time when that person leaves or is called somewhere else. That is awesome. I love that. And um, yeah, the pastors uh, take that into account. I think that's that's an excellent idea because that addresses that whole, you know, knee jerk reaction, that sense of urgency that, you know, kind of that that fear and uncertainty that builds up. Uh, whenever you lose a key staff member. So that's that's golden. I love that succession plan, 90 days. Um, so we, we've talked about finding great staff. Now let's kind of uh, push that a little further. What are some keys that, that you've uh, experienced from your own pastorate as, as a lead pastor, but then also that you've gleaned from, you know, all of your colleagues, all of your the friends, the pastors you've worked with over the years uh, when it comes to keeping great staff? Mm, that's so good. That's so good. Yeah, I, you know, one thing I'm realizing the more I work with churches is that nearly every church staff that I've encountered is comprised almost 100 percent of broken, sinful people. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. Figure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an amazing, <laughs> consistent statistic. And so and I, and I say that with an intention. It's easy to get frustrated with people. People screw up. Uh, this podcast got screwed up because someone on our team didn't do the time zone math on when we were supposed to call, but I'm not going to let that bug me, right? Right, right. So I would say one of the keys for retaining great staff is to lead with grace and remember that we are forgiven people and that this is just a bunch of broken sinners that need a savior and mistakes are going to happen. So singular mistakes I very rarely fire for. And if anything, I'll show more grace than is necessary so that the person walks away going, wow, wow, I work in a place that makes room for human error. That's and good, so, yeah. And, and one way I do that is a very tangible thing that I was taught many years ago as a pastor. I think, it's, I think it is more true to me now than it was even years ago. And that is any praise you're going to give somebody or forgiveness or grace, anytime you're speaking into them in a way that will encourage their heart, do it in written form. And and anytime you're going to admonish somebody or correct them or do it verbally. And, and it's usually the opposite. When you've got something, what you want to do, when you've got something good to tell somebody, you want to go tell them face to face. And when you've got bad news, it's like, uh, I'd rather just put it in a text or in right, email. Right, right, exactly. But, but the truth is people will reread what's in their inbox many times if it creates emotion. So if you want a good emotion to get replayed over and over, write it down. And and by the same token, don't write down admonition unless you're just doing a paper trail for HR because people will sit and read that over and over and over and they'll replay the emotional journey. So write down a lot of praise. Make a lot of room for grace. Uh, those would be two of the biggest retention models I know. The other thing I would say is get a handle on your church culture. And I don't mean the church body as a whole, but your your staff. Like, what do you guys do? Here's a question to ask yourself at your staff meeting. Say, you know, when we're functioning at our very highest redemptive potential, when we have one of those days where we all go to bed going, man, we got something right today. What were we doing that's common to our team, but uncommon to teams as a whole? You know, it, it, for some people, it's like we laugh a lot around here. Figure out what those values are or we respond very quickly. That's one of ours. And figure out those values and lean into them. And when you know your cultural values and you create a tight culture, people will will never want to leave that culture. Uh, you know, the, the final thing I'd say is you as a boss need to be a, a servant and someone who respects the people that work for you and, you know, kind of be the guy that would wash their feet. If there's one truth about why people leave companies, they don't leave companies. They lead bad bosses. Mm. Focus on how you can serve and love. Show grace and mercy. And that doesn't mean just forgive every single time. I, 
I should back up and put a caveat on the lead with grace and be forgiving and make them go, wow. Singular events are going to happen because we're broken. Some singular events warrant a red card. We have a written list of what those are and everybody should, you know, it's, you know, the adultery or money or whatever the things are. There's your red card. Sorry, dude, that's on the list. You got to go. But other than that, singular events are not going to get you in trouble. But I tell my staff all the time, there's power in the pattern. So if you start seeing a pattern of the same mistake, then it might be time to have a different set of conversations. Right. That's good. And I, I think it's important that we let our staff know that there is some freedom to make mistakes, just not repeat those mistakes. Because if you're not giving them room to make mistakes, then more than likely they're going to be, um, they're not going to be stretching, right, when it comes to, to their area of ministry. They're not really going to be kind of pushing forward because if they have that fear that, um, you know, mistakes are going to be an issue, then they're, they're just going to play it safe. Yeah. Totally. A couple other things that cause people to leave their their jobs. I mean, you know, people leave bosses. They don't leave companies. Uh, people leave when they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, I hate review meetings. They're, I hate meetings. <laughs> but, but they're so necessary to say, okay, we've got a scorecard. We said this is what we wanted to see done. How, how do you feel you, like you're doing? Here's how I feel like you're doing. So they know what they're supposed to do. And then the last thing would be, if they know what they're supposed to do, but you haven't equipped them with the tools or resources to actually get it done. So I end, sometimes I begin, but somewhere in the review, I'll always say, what can I do better or what can I equip you with so that you can get the things done that we've said we want you to get done? Yeah. There's nothing worse than having that expectation, but not the resources or tools or time to to meet those expectations, right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. That's awesome. So that's great. So talk about finding great staff, talk about keeping great staff. Now, I would like you, if you could, um, of course, lots of pastors out there, and I'm sure that that some in our audience are pastors kind of finding themselves in a transition. They're coming into a transition or in the midst of a transition. What advice do you have for pastors who are transitioning, um, you know, maybe looking for another ministry position? Just what would you tell them to, to kind of focus in on? Yeah, so for guys or women that are thinking it might be time to leave, my first rule of advice is wait till Tuesday. <laughs> Monday is such a bummer as a pastor. Yep. And, and there, there, there are actually studies that show public speakers, whether it's politicians or entertainers or pastors, public speakers, the really good ones especially, almost all are somewhere on the continuum of manic depressive. And, and I don't mean that in a y'all are all sick kind of way. I mean, we're all on spectrums, right? right. Everybody's, some, everybody's on the continuum somewhere. But they lean a little bit more toward, I'm going to put it all out there, and then I'm going to be down. And that's what you do on Sunday. If you're preaching, you leave your soul on the platform stage, pulpit, whichever your vernacular is. Right. You, you're doing everything. You're, you're facing the number one fear people have, public speaking. You're not just doing public speaking, but you're uh, telling people this is what God says for your life. And then you're reading an email from somebody about how you had a split infinitive or a dangling participle or a statistic wrong because they Googled you during your <laughs> – and, and, you know, you wake up on Monday, it's like, golly. So – a lot of people will email us saying, I'm thinking about a transition, and we have a super OCD system to track all that. And I would say half the people that do that do it on Monday. Wow. And, and we like uniformly say, just wait till Tuesday. So if God's calling you to the close of a season, then give it a little bit of time because his voice is going to get louder, not softer. It's not like he's going to say it once and then that'll be that. You can That's read all, yeah. all through scripture. The voice will get louder, not softer. And I would say never just run from something. It's it's God closes one door and opens another. He doesn't have a purgatory for your career. So, you know, your calling should be, I've finished my work here and I'm leaving toward this work there. And, and I know they're in between times and their church budget cuts. And then sometimes you work for somebody who's a little erratic and you get fired for what you think is no reason. But in an ideal world, if you're thinking about a transition, I think that you should take your time. I think you should say, am I just trying to leave here or am I leaving here and going somewhere else? And then the last thing I would say is start thinking about how you can finish well. 
People will remember how you left long after they've forgotten what you did while you were there. Wow, that's good. So, yeah, I, it's just it's such a difference. And I will say, you know, we work with some churches that uh, I used to be pretty possessive of my staff and, and not in a healthy way at all. I was you're with me for life. And if you're thinking about leaving, you must not like me or you must be disloyal or you must, I was just not in a good spot then. And, um, I, I finally got a wake up call and it was like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but I think Jesus was saying to me, you know what, William, all these people say it's one church, many locations. It's actually one kingdom, many locations, and it's my kingdom. And, you know, if somebody's called somewhere else, it's not because they don't like you. It's because I need them redeployed. Nice. So for bosses out there who maybe have fallen into that place that I was, I get it. I've been there. I totally understand. It's one kingdom, many locations. If you're feeling like you're being disloyal to your house by leaving a church, there is a disloyal way to do it. And that's wrong. And that doesn't honor God. And he usually ends up having something to say about it. But it doesn't mean that you're chained to your place forever. You're chained to Jesus. You are a Jesus person not anybody else's. And if you go through a careful prayer and discernment time, there is a right way to do things. Uh, final word on that. If you're thinking about a transition, I've been a senior pastor. It is a lonely, lonely spot. And that's part of the reason I think I was so insecure back then about l people leaving. And a lot of really smart, godly, wonderful men and women that I know that are pastors are so nervous about people leaving that if you go talk to them about it, you might get fired. So I would be really careful about hastily going to talk to your pastor about the sense that it might be time to leave because they might immediately say, let me help you step into your new destiny. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> so it, there's a right way to do it. There's a right time to do it. And it'll be different for every context. But, you know, wait till Tuesday. Make sure you're not running away from where you are and that you're running to something. Make sure you're not sticking around just because you've got some weird sense that you belong to this person or, or particular church. And, and be really careful and prayerful about how to go talk to your pastor. That's excellent, William. That, that's, that's some great practical advice. Um, several nuggets, I mean, just, just in the short time we've been together that, that you've uh, shared. And I know our pastors will be able to... Um, kind of glean from those insights and, and learn and grow. Just before we take off, if someone wants to connect with you in some way, what's the best way to do that? Just Google Vanderblumen. So easy to spell. Just type it in there. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, Jason. I, I did, My one rule, we hired an SEO consultant, you know, search engine optimization right. uh, consultant when we started the company. And I said, I, it can't be named after me. And I think I have like lifetime platinum status with GoDaddy because we bought about 300 domain names like we staff the church.com. We'll find your pastor.com. It was ridiculous. So here are the domain names. You tell us which one to use. Can't be named after me. He came back and he said, We're going to name it after you. I said, well, I, it doesn't need to be about me. And, I, and it needs to grow past me. And he said, Yeah, but the, the truth is, your last name is so screwed up, you can misspell it a hundred ways in Google and it'll pop up. So <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm really kind of not kidding. Just go to Vanderblum in, in your Google, or spell it however you want, it'll pop up. Click on there. And not only will it give you a way to get in touch with us, but it will give you access to, I think we're over a thousand free resources out there on that site for you to help run your team. I went to one of the best seminaries and it is an Ivy League seminary and I learned great things. I didn't have one class or tip on how to run a staff meeting. So go to the site, take whatever you want from the free resources. We hope it helps you because I know nobody trains you for this and then you're expected to be a CEO all of a sudden. Oh, I love that. I love that. Thank you for all that, those free resources for our pastors. And thank you for being with us, William. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, a lot of great stuff that you guys and your team are doing, and we certainly appreciate how you're serving the kingdom and uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason, and thanks for all you're doing for the Big C Church. It's making a difference. God bless you, brother. You too. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Every week, as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders podcast, and if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts, 
so they can benefit uh, from these interviews as well. And again, we thank you in advance. If you have any comments, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.